define pro-social behavior, we're going to talk about some discrete subtypes of pro-social behavior in a bit more detail. It's such a broad umbrella, I like to break it down into little groups. And these are going to kind of layer on top of each other. For the first section, we're going to talk about regulation. This overlaps greatly with what we talked about in Unit 1 on temperament. So for regulation, we're really looking at the work by Nancy Eisenberg. And Nancy Eisenberg did a lot of research on how infants regulate themselves, how children and school-aged kids regulate themselves, and the benefits of being well self-regulated. We find emotional regulation is akin to biological homeostasis. When somebody is very aroused in an emotional way in order to calm down, there usually has to be a catalyst to help them calm down. And whether that's an aggressive explosion or whether it's doing calming meditation or crying, it can help us to reach that homeostasis. I, for one, am a big proponent of crying. Crying actually is a great tool to reach homeostasis in your arousal. And so what happens in crying is uh, when, you, when you cry, you actually release prolactin and you also release endorphins. And so this helps you to genuinely feel better after a good cry. Uh, when you're stressed out, I recommend not hesitating to cry. I think it's a fantastic tool that can make us to be healthier. And we find that people who express their emotions rather than suppress their emotions, they live longer and they have lower levels of long-term stress. So right from infancy, we know this. We know this. Infants will cry to regulate themselves. They'll also do some things like suck on their thumb or fall asleep or wake up or all these different things to keep themselves in a comfortable position. And so as we get older, we don't just cry for biological homeostasis, we start to cry as a tool to use in social co coercion. We might cry for attention or cry to negotiate a situation or cry just to express our frustration and show that we want uh, comfort in others and they need to help regulate us through cuddling or through kind words. We also can learn to regulate through social modeling, how we saw our parents or our older siblings or role models on TV uh, to regulate themselves is how we will learn. If somebody stomps their feet and yells, we're going to learn to stomp our feet and yell. If somebody goes to the room or plays music, we're going to learn these different tools. By roughly the age four, four and a half, most kids, however, have learned that when they're really upset, maybe they're not just going to cry and scream at their parents, though sometimes they certainly will. Maybe they will seek out solitude. Maybe they want to go to a little quiet corner of the house and calm down. Maybe they want to go to their room. Maybe they'll exit the room and cry in the hallway. Uh, this is pretty age appropriate. It's pretty developmentally typical, and it allows them to have that time to reflect. Some kids don't know how to do this on their own, and this would be a good time and appropriate usage of timeouts to help give them that reflection space. And one of the things I do recommend in young kids' homes is always to have like a little quiet area, maybe called a cuddle zone, uh, where they can have pillows and, and little cuddly, tactile things. And it's not a punishment area, it's not a cage. A lot of kids really like to sit in the bottoms of closets, whether it's in their bedroom or a hallway linen closet, and maybe have some pillows and, and some things there, and not in an area where it's going to be a suffocation hazard and they can just kind of retreat there when they're overstimulated or they're over aroused. It can really help them with that. So this is some basics of self-regulation, but we want to dive a little bit deeper and talk about some components that are important in regulating our behavior. And that is being aware of our emotions, our own temperamental and emotional stability, and the coping strategies we can learn to develop over time. So in terms of emotional awareness, this is the first step we need in self-regulation. It's hard to regulate if you're not aware of what's happening to your body. We know that we can get so busy in our day-to-day -day life that we're not really taking time to check in with ourselves and how do I feel about this? Sometimes stress can climb up before we even realize. And sometimes we're not sure what we're feeling. One of the best things to do is when kids are really young uh, to help them by labeling their emotions. Kids understand the primary emotions at a pretty young age, happy, mad, sad, fearful, uh, but sometimes they have a hard time. So labeling, you're really mad right now. And it's okay to be angry. You're not a bad person for being angry. Everyone's angry. Uh, that type of behavior can really help uh, for a child to feel more confident about their emotions. As they get older, by the time they're preschoolers, most kids have developed very aware feelings of lots of self-conscious emotions. They're gonna feel really powerful embarrassment when somebody talks about them in front of them in third person. They're gonna feel really strong jealousy if a parental figure cuddles a child or an infant younger than them. And they're gonna feel betrayed if somebody promised them something and went back on their word. So those are very real self-conscious emotions they feel very early in the lifespan. So helping them to label that, 
You felt embarrassed when we had that talk at the doctor's office about you. You felt jealous when uh, we had to babysit your cousin. There, there's all kinds of nice ways you can label it, and it doesn't make these emotions any easier, but it does help them to recognize that what they're going through is normative and they can put words on it. And then throughout our lifespan, we continue to uh, experience lots of complex and hybrid emotions. You might feel nervous and excited or nervous sighted at the same time. You might feel disappointed and frustrated about something at the same time. And this is something we constantly work at through adolescence and adulthood. And this is the idea we're trying to navigate. How do I, I feel so many things at once. Embracing the fact that you certainly can feel multiple things at once is helpful. And you can be mindful of all those different feelings. And so practicing mindfulness, checking in on yourself in a non-judgmental way. You are allowed to feel angry. You're allowed to be afraid. You're allowed to be anxious. You're allowed to be jealous. All your feelings are valid. And so just being aware and reflective of your emotions is a great starting step. Once we're aware of what we're feeling, then we have to take into tune how often do we have these strong feelings. And this can vary from person to person. This has to do with our temperamental reactivity, if you think about the Thomas and Chess model. So some of us, we just react more. If we have a bad day, it's a really bad day. If somebody sends us a nasty note, some of us, we're gonna cry heavily about it, we're gonna feel anxious about it for days. Some of us, if somebody sends you a nasty note, you're gonna laugh it off and you know, curse a little bit, and 15 minutes later, you forgot about it. And so all of us have a different physiological baseline for how we react to things. Some of us, our brain is just gonna fire more, everything in our, in our head is gonna light up more, some of us will be less. And so there's gonna be a lot of individual difference. Now, regardless of your temperamental emotional stability, we also find there's other biological things that can make you more reactive. We can find if, if your rest of your homeostasis is off kilter, if you're not well rested, if you have higher levels of cortisol because it's midterm or final exam time, we find if there is something wrong with your diet, you haven't been eating healthy or you've been drinking too much caffeine, that can make you more reactive. We also find there's some cognitive things that can predict this reactivity. For instance, uh, those who are struggling more with inhibitory control or executive function, they might be more impulsive and they may be more just to jump to conclusions and to perceive things in a more negative way or in a more threatening way. And so not having that ability to kind of inhibit your thoughts and take a step back could also make you more reactive uh, and more stressed out. And finally, there is individual differences in distress tolerance. This is how you can endure a stressful moment. Some of us, we just fight or flight goes into mode. If something is stressing us out, if we're really upset, we need to scream and run away about it. Some of us, we can calmly sip our tea and take a few breaths and sit there in, in the pain. And so your distress tolerance is something that's very individual and you can get training for this. We do find, for instance, individuals with borderline personality disorder, they may have very low distress tolerance. And one of the recommended therapies for them is uh, through dialectical therapy, a component is teaching distress tolerance, teaching people to sit with the distress and sit with the unhappy emotions and learn how to tolerate that pain rather than fleeing from the pain all the time. And so these different individual components can certainly impact our emotional regulation skills. Now, aside from our emotional awareness and our emotional stability, we can work towards better regulation skills through our coping strategies. And we know there's lots of ways to cope. What we want to try and develop is more de-escalation or adaptive coping skills. So these are coping skills that are either going to help solve the problem through being assertive and talking about the problem head on or doing goal-directed behaviors to lower the stressful situation. If something's really bad, you talk about it, you reduce the problem. Or sometimes you can't reduce the problem, you just need to relax and de-escalate yourself. So this could be self-soothing behaviors like listening to classical music or meditating. It could be walking in nature it could be reading a book, anything that will help you find that serenity. It could also be things like just rationalizing, not ruminating, but rationalizing the problem and realize, okay, that was just one person's opinion. I know who I am. I can get through this. And any type of thinking that actually makes you feel better at the end would be considered to be adaptive. What we don't want to go towards are the escalation techniques that are maladaptive. And these include ruminating, which is thinking about something that doesn't make you feel better. Thinking about something that makes you feel worse over and over and over again. It's like poking a bruise. If you had an embarrassing situation or someone gave you critical feedback and you constantly keep reading the nasty email over and over again, or you constantly keep uh, thinking about it and blaming yourself and assuming you're the one in the wrong and they're the one in the right, uh, that's going to be very maladaptive. It's also going to be maladaptive to avoid the 
situation or to run away or flee from it. And of course, it'll be maladaptive to explode or to display aggression towards something because those are not going to be problem oriented behaviors. They're not going to resolve the situation and they're not going to resolve your level of arousal. So that's why we want to try and avoid them. Now, also included in the maladaptive set would be a special type of avoidance, and that's when you don't try and physically avoid, but you try to mentally avoid through the use of substances. So whether it's uh, cannabis or alcohol or what have you, using substances to avoid a situation would also be considered maladaptive because you're not solving the problem. And although it might calm you down in the interim, uh, long term, that might cause even more problems. There is some debate about how much is okay, like perhaps a glass of wine at the end of a long day is somewhat adaptive. Uh, that's for sure definitely a gray area. All right, and so that was our little bit about regulation.